Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of Pete's CD Vinyl World. Today I went to a book review and also uh, just show some pickups uh, I've had uh, today. I was on vacation for the past week, uh, so that's why I haven't done a video lately. But um, today the book I wanted to review was Eruption in the Canyon by Andrew Bennett. So, uh, backstory behind this book is Andrew Bennett was hired by Eddie Van Halen basically to document um, everything that was going on at 5150 Studio. And at first this takes place uh, in 2004, right when they were re reuniting with Sammy Hagar to do a tour. Um, and after that period, it, it goes to 2007 when they were reuniting for David Lee Roth to do that tour. But Basically, the long story uh, or the short story is that Andrew had filmed all this footage for um, a period of time and um, eventually was not paid for it. And he went ahead and released some of the footage on YouTube and, of course, had a cease and desist order um, filed against him by Eddie Van Halen, blah, blah, blah. Um, he came out with this book last year. At first, the book was taken off the market. And then I saw somewhere that it was available um, for a short time. So I went on the site and grabbed it. Um, I looked recently. It is still available. I'm assuming because as a photographer, he owns all of his photography. Um, whereas maybe the video stuff he had uh, was the videographer for, maybe he... It was in their contract that he didn't own that stuff. That's why, uh, you know, they got sued for uh, releasing on YouTube. But basically, he claims that they never paid him for the footage and blah, blah, blah. So anyway, this book is mostly photographs. You can see uh, pretty detailed photographs there. And it does go into his time, but it's, it's not very long. You can see the typeface that it's pretty, pretty big. But, um, yeah, it, it goes into uh, that time period. So if you remember 2004, they were putting out a Greatest Hits album called uh, Best of Both Worlds, and they were recording three new songs with Sammy Hagar. That's about the time that uh, he started filming there. And he describes how, like, um, you know, this, this was a period, if you're a Van Halen fan, where Eddie was at probably his worst as far as uh, his addiction issues and drinking issues. Um, but he also says that he was a complete workaholic. He was in the studio for 18 hours a day. And um, he would get pissed at the other members um, because, you know, they, they just didn't want to do their parts and leave. In fact, he says that at one point there was a fist fight between him and Alex and he ended up throwing Alex's keys to his Porsche and then this is 2004. This is not like in the late seventies when they're still young. I mean, they're in their early fifties at this point and they're still fist fighting, you know? Um, um, yeah. So he pretty much claims that Eddie was very, very insecure, which I, I think comes from the fact that both Dave and Sammy had left at some point. Um, I'm going out of order of the book here, but you know, he describes how at one point, this was when, uh, in 2007, when they were rehearsing for the uh, reunion tour with David Lee Roth. David Lee Roth had actually asked the author to come uh, film this samurai sword sequence that was used during the 2007 tour. I think one of the intros or drum solo or something like that. So uh, the way the relationship ended with Van Halen and Andrew, Andrew Bennett was... He, wanted to, he went to go pick up his stuff at 5150. He claims he fell asleep in his office or wherever, and he wakes up with a gun to his head, uh, and Eddie's like, uh, so you're friends with Dave now. So this is going on, like, the whole Eddie versus Dave is even going on right when they were about to get together. So it's kind of crazy. Another story that came out in the press recently was um, early 2000s, I guess, um, Limp Biscuit guitar player left, so one of the, he Eddie was out one night, and uh, their manager asked Eddie to come by and jam with the band or whatever. 
So he went there and basically said, you know, these guys are a bunch of amateurs or whatever. Just left and left all his equipment there. So he kept calling Fred Durst, the singer of Limp Bizkit, uh, and not getting a response. So Eddie himself took a uh, Russian military assault vehicle that had a machine gun mounted on the back uh, and uh, drove through the streets of L.A. right to Fred's, Fred Durst's house, uh, knocks on the door, puts a gun to his head, and said, give me my equipment. So it's crazy that he's he was even in that mindset because he, Eddie's had an assistant that's worked for him for about 30 years called Matt Brook, who handles all his guitars, all of his equipments. He basically works full-time at... 5150. It's like, why wouldn't you just go send him to do it? Like, um, another quick story that was pretty funny was they had uh, the roof repaired at 5150 Studio, and apparently, their one of the entrance ways doesn't have like a great lock or something like that. And Eddie was n apparently nervous about it all night and said, Those workers are those guys are going to come back. I know it to like steal equipment or whatever. So, Eddie. Uh, and this is verified by the author. He was there. And Eddie slept all night in his uh, studio. And sure enough, the guys tried to break in. He goes and chases the guys with an Uzi. And basically to the point where they were having to climb up a mountain. Apparently, Eddie's um, estate is a series of lots. So it's, he almost owns like a whole mountain, apparently. so. But these guys had to climb up a mountain with Eddie shooting at him. So the cops got there and they found the guys and it was two cops, a younger cop and an older cop. And, uh, they, the younger cop says something like, you know, it's illegal to own one of these guns in here. Right. And so the older cop pulls them aside and says, uh, you know, that nothing is illegal to this guy. <laughs> you know? So I guess there's an understanding with a guy like Eddie Van Halen and the cops. But anyway, uh, the book, it is worth it because it's got a lot of cool pictures of his guitars in the studio. I'm just going to try to find one real quick. So, like, for example, guitars hanging up, and it's got his original Ibanez Destroyer there, some of his PVs, and, um, you know, the author says that he plays guitar, like, all day, literally. And he still plays his old guitars. He's on the cover here with his old Frankenstein. You can even see some of his Kramers hanging up in the wall. So, he, even though he had his own signature, signature guitars with PV and uh, Fender, EVH brand, he still picks up whatever guitar. Author also, out of curiosity, also says he plays a lot of bass around. Um, but, you know, he... he I think all of the insecurity with Eddie started around Van Halen 3. He thought that was going to be like his masterpiece, you know, and it didn't sell well. And ever since then, you know, they've only put out one album with David Lee Roth. And it was most of those songs were pre-date Van Halen 1. So it's crazy to think of all of the uh, unreleased songs that are at 5150. Hopefully it will come out one day. But, you know, if you're a Van Halen fan, an Eddie fan, and just curious about what he's like at home in the studio I highly re recommend picking this up uh, so moving on to some of the pickups I found um, this is one I found yesterday at yard sale it's a box set the magic of Walt Disney four record set I guess uh, soundtrack stuff from all their movies at first I wasn't gonna get it and my son was like well why don't you just get it? it's got a book in it and everything so I was like okay so I paid three bucks for it at a yard sale I looked online on eBay they're going for between 25 and 40 so I'm just going to hang on to it just to have it because it's got a cool book and everything so that was the first thing I picked up um, then today I went to the uh, Man Cave in uh, Bordentown and also stopped at the Record Collector up the street and I got some CDs and some vinyl uh, first one is uh, Yes Drama that was one of the few Yes albums I didn't have and this one's got a bunch of bonus tracks on it, which is cool. Because I know on this tour they played a couple songs live that weren't on the album. But in total, um, this has 16 songs, so it looks like it's got 17 bonus tracks. I mean, 7 bonus tracks, so glad to get that. I got the Who, My Generation Deluxe Edition. It's just an extra disc of all um, bonus songs, different mixes, unreleased songs. Who Sell Out. 
This also has a bunch of bonus tracks. And a quick one, which also has a bunch of bonus tracks as well. It's funny that uh, these were, the, I believe, the last two albums I needed besides Tommy. Because I have everything from like Live at Leeds on. But I never had any of their 60s albums, ironically. I just had a couple singles collections in that. But I had Tommy on vinyl back in the 90s. It was one that I had sold because at the time... They were in the mid, not by the mid '90s. They were playing Tommy like constantly. There's always live versions of it. Um, turns out now I'd really like to have another copy of that so I can complete the collection. And um, I actually prefer after hearing Tommy live so many times between Woodstock and the Isle of Wight and the '89 tour, I, I just want to. I think I really enjoy the studio versions because it's just the band. You know, I hate when the Who tours and they got like ten extra musicians and stuff. I'm glad the one time I saw them. In 2002, it was just um, the four of them and their, a keyboard player and uh, Pete Townsend's brother, Simon. So I got to see them. Since then, they've gone back to adding all those extra musicians, and I don't really care for that. I'd rather just hear the band, the core band. Um, so the vinyl I've picked up. And the man cave, I, the ones I got were a few of them. They were like four for ten. So the first one I got was uh, another copy of Angel White Hot. I already have this, but the vinyl was in uh, better condition on this one. And the, re the real reason I picked this up... Um, uh, where is it? Was because uh, it had the um, order form. In it. Where is it? Oh, there it is. So, I wanted to get a copy with that in there. I find these things really cool. You could see the uh, t shirts and stuff you were able to order back then. Just like, you know, this is Casablanca, also, same stuff that came with the Kiss albums. So, uh, I'm glad I found a copy of that with that. Um, next up. The Cars Panorama. Uh, I believe this is the only one I didn't have also. So uh, I was glad to find that pretty reasonable. Uh, this one I got as a record collector, Dock and Breaking the Chains. It's the only uh, one I didn't have from the original, well, the classic lineup or whatever. Used to have this way back when also, but finally got it. Um, Steppenwolf Monster. I don't know any songs on here, but I heard this is really good, and this is in really good shape. It's an original one. Uh, Sweet, Give Us a Wink. I believe this is the follow-up to Desolation Boulevard. And the uh, Record Store Day single from Cheap Trick last year. Give Me Some Truth. It's on red vinyl. Happen to have one sitting there. And also, when I bought this, the uh, owner, Randy, said, uh, do you have their Christmas album? And I said, no, actually, that's the only Cheap Trick album I don't have. And he looked under something. He said, I got a copy of it. And he, he had one on vinyl. So now I have this on vinyl, which is pretty cool. So anyway, just want to show those and uh, give a quick book review. So... Thanks a lot. If you like these videos, please subscribe. Talk to you later. Bye.